Okay, I, I think we'll make a start. Uh, Ian Doyle is my name. I work for the Heritage Council as Head of Conservation. And I have a very easy job here today. My job is simply to welcome you and thank you all for joining us today on behalf of the Heritage Council. Uh, National Heritage Week is vital in raising awareness about and appreciation in Ireland's amazing heritage. Um, we have lots of partners in the organization of National Heritage Week and it was launched last week by Minister of State Malcolm Noonan TD uh, with so many of those partners in the Irish Times and Office of Public Works and Landmark Trust and so on. But really its success is dependent upon the dedication, energy and ingenuity of project organizers. You. You guys. Now, once again, because of COVID-19, Heritage Week 2021 will be project-based, um, like what we had to do last year. Um, but its ethos, again, but perhaps more so this year, is about inclusivity. Really, it's about encouraging as many people as possible to connect with Heritage, this time mainly in that online format. And you'll hear more about that over the next hour. Um, so I really don't have much more to say, other than I'm now going to hand you over to Susan O'Keefe, who will chair this meeting for approximately the next hour or so. So on behalf of the Heritage Council, again, thank you very much. Ian, thank you very much for your introduction. And it's great to be here today with so many people enthusiastic about sharing the heritage of our country. And it's been terrific to watch Heritage Week grow from just sort of buildings being open and people being allowed into places and spaces that they'd never seen before. And for it to open up now into, as we are now this year, project-based, but encouraging and including so many new groups of people uh, into Heritage Week and finding new and innovative ways to enjoy and to begin to understand and to treasure our heritage across the country in all its forms. Heritage Week, the 14th to the 22nd of August, I think this year will be exceptionally busy. I think people are beginning to engage even more than before. And perhaps that's been one of the great benefits of a time when things were difficult for the last months, uh, uh, um, this year and last year. For people to go out into the community, to find new things to talk about and look at, to ask questions about things they'd never noticed before, uh, just around the corner or up the hill. So, that, I think, will bring a new audience already uh, to this piece. Uh, we'd like particularly to thank Catherine White, uh, who is here today uh, as the Irish, language, Irish Sign Language interpreter. And it's lovely, again, to be able to include, for the first time, a, a group of people who may not otherwise have been able to enjoy and to be part of this webinar. So before we go to our panelists who are going to share their passion and their projects by way of kicking off this meeting, um, I'm going to hand over to Thelma Harris. Uh, she works with DHR Communications in conjunction with the Heritage Week project. So Thelma, thanks. Thank you, Susan. And I just have a few slides um, that I'm going to share. So we'll just wait for those to appear. Thanks, Martina. Um, so yes, yeah, so as Susan mentioned, my name is Thelma and I'm from DHR Communications. We are working with the Heritage Council to deliver National Heritage Week 2021. This afternoon, I want to give you a short introduction to this year's National Heritage Week and highlight some important dates for you. The first one, of course, are the dates for National Heritage Week. So it'll be kicking off on Saturday, the 14th of August until Sunday, the 22nd of August. We are again inviting you to share heritage projects with us for a National Heritage Week and, and many of you will be familiar with that approach from last year. This year's focus is on getting as many people as possible to enjoy heritage. And we are encouraging you to cast the net wide and consider reaching out to groups in your community that may not traditionally feel included in heritage. We are also encouraging project organizers like yourselves to consider elements of heritage that may have been overlooked in the past. 
So for this, we have three recommended approaches. Heritage newcomers, a general invitation to individuals, families and communities who have never engaged in National Heritage Week before. Heritage sharing, an invitation to existing project organizers to connect with a group or individuals in the community who may not feel included in local heritage or an opportunity to explore an aspect of local heritage that is seldom considered or celebrated. And the third one then is heritage for all ages. So this is an invitation to project organizers to include different age groups in, project, in heritage projects. And we have really good examples today on the panel of, of where this has been achieved in, in previous years. So we'll just move on to the next slide. And then as, as usual, we have our, our two themed days for National Heritage Week, Water Heritage Day and Wild Child Day. Um, so, and we can see the dates there. So Sunday the 22nd will be Water Heritage Day and Wednesday the 18th will be Wild Child Day. And then we just so and then we have the, the timeline for so this is just to give you um, an idea of the, the approach for this year. So last Wednesday we did our, our big launch and from from the 16th we, we are now accepting heritage projects via the, the Heritage Week website. Then projects that are completed should be shared with us in time for Heritage Week, which is the 14th to the 22nd of August. And there's an example there of, of different formats that you could organize your projects in and share them with us. And these slides, we'll, we'll share those with you after the webinar today as well. And then we're asking project organizers to share their projects with us in time for National Heritage Week, but no later than Monday, the 30th of August. And the reason that this date is, is just after Heritage Week is to give those of you that maybe are working on projects or delivering in-person events during Heritage Week, the opportunity to gather those outcomes and share them with us. So that the final date will be the 30th of August. And then any, any projects that we receive before that date will be eligible to be considered for a National Heritage Week award. And then these are just a, a few slides on the different, the different approaches. And it's just examples of, of things that you might consider. So if we look at the third one there, this is Heritage Newcomers. Um, have you become more aware of nature in your locality, birds, animals, and plants that you didn't know the names of? So this would be encouraging a, a project on the biodiversity or the wildlife in your, your area. Um, and the next one, is heritage sharing. So again, a few examples there of, of something that you might consider. And then the third one there, please. And again, heritage for all ages. So this is looking at um, involving younger people in your heritage project or intergenerational projects. And so how can you link different generations within your community in your project? And I think we won't go through those today, but it might be worth revisiting after the webinar when you get a chance. And then our final look at, at Heritage Week is just the, the key dates. So as I mentioned, we had the, the launch on the 16th of June and we are now live and we are accepting Heritage projects and have re received a, a good few even since last Wednesday. So that's uh, really exciting for us. Then we have the, the webinars. So this is the first of our, our series of webinars. And next week we have two on the 22nd or the, the 29th of June. And, and if you haven't seen details of those there, they're on the Heritage Week website. Then that leads us into National Heritage Week on the 14th of August. We have that date, the 30th of August, where you, you should have shared your heritage project with us by then to be um, eligible for the National Heritage Week awards. On the 6th of September, nominations open for the National Heritage Hero Award and then in October, we'll have that big celebration, the National Heritage Week Awards. Um, and this, again, is something to revisit after the webinar. But it just gives you an idea of um, what the project might look like. Again, there's some examples of, of the format. So is it, you might look at social media, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, you might engage with your local media. And one of our webinars next week 
will actually go through um, the technical side of sharing your project with us. So, you know, that step of how will I take my project online onto the Heritage Week website. And we'll just move on to the, the last slide. And um, so these are our contact details. So myself and uh, my colleague Lila are available via that, that phone number or via the Heritage Week at heritagecouncil.ie email if you have any queries about Heritage Week this year, about the website, or if you want information or resources, please feel free to, to contact us and we'd be delighted to, to help you out there. So I'll just pass you back to Susan. I know that was a maybe a lot to take in. So as I said, those slides will be circulated afterwards. So thank you very much, Thelma. And I think that it's fair to say that there's such a, a great um, number of people participating today that there's a huge hunger and thirst to get involved and to help groups of all, of all ages, of all sizes, find the wild child in all of them. And um, I think it will be a very successful um, Heritage Week. So we are going to hear now from our panelists Remember, as you're listening to them, <clears throat> they've promised that they'll be short, which is simply because of the time. <clears throat> but each of them have websites, each of them have places that you can see more about what they do. They're here really to share their passion so that it can begin to feed into your own passion and to you extending that passion uh, into the people that you are going to be dealing with and the way in which you're going to be encouraging and supporting a variety of projects during this time. And how lovely that now we can use blogs, we can use radio, we can use podcast, we can use newspapers, we can use small recordings, social media. There are so many ways now to embrace Heritage Week and the technical details will be shared with you uh, at the next, at the next um, webinar. So first we have um, a very passionate man indeed <clears throat> called Lorcan Scott. And I'm sure many of you know Lorcan, <clears throat> he works for the Heritage Council. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> he's been a park ranger, he's been a heritage officer and his great love is biodiversity. <clears throat> it's a challenge that faces all of us. It's a challenge that faces the planet and everything that we can do to bring biodiversity and the need to understand it to life. Well, I think Lorcan is one of these people that will be leading that charge in Ireland and helping others to share that too. So this is one of the ways in which Heritage Week can help with that. So Lorcan, off you go and, and bring to life the, the need and the ways in which this audience can help with biodiversity. Thank you, Susan. Um, so yes, uh, well, I am involved in two uh, projects, Project Lead, two projects here with the Heritage Council that have a very strong social element to them. Uh, the first project I'll talk about is uh, Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, Wildlife Sanctuary came about uh, from a previous uh, job I had with the Parks and Wildlife Service. I used to uh, work with uh, raised bogs in the Midlands and driving through some of the Midland towns around Port, uh, Port Leash and Monastery Evan and that, th there was a, a strong presence of people uh, seeking asylum, refugees who were uh, living in these towns, looking to get a bus moving around the town, walking and that. And uh, at the time, I would be very much involved in uh, conservation volunteer projects in relation to bog restoration, uh, habitat management and invasive species control. And it, it did occur to me that uh, here we have some people who were at the time in direct provision with uh, very little outlets to get involved in Ireland's uh, habitats and ecosystems, biodiversity, and that maybe we could bring them together by um, developing a project that would support them in their ability to uh, get involved in some of the volunteer programmes that were being run around the Midlands with these bogs. So I uh, sought advice from uh, officialdom. And uh, the first thing I'd say is um, it, it, they're a very difficult group to deal with. They're, uh, as I say, in direct provision centers, they're quite transient. They have very little English, but they, are, they too are very passionate and uh, 
they really appreciate anyone who bring a helping hand to them. So uh, the, the best advice I can give is just go directly to your local direct provision centre, see if you can help offer to uh, maybe just first of all, see what their needs are and if you can match them to the needs of your locality. So a lot of them would be very much involved in um, men's sheds, tidy town groups and uh, organisations like that. But if you have a volunteer group, um, the extra help that you can give to this group to, to bring them, to get them involved is, is really, you know, very important. And they, they give back so much. Uh, one advice I got was um, not, not to ask them too many questions. In getting to Ireland, whatever way they got here, they would have been met by uh, officialdom and asked, you know, where are you from? What age are you? And uh, what is your background? They, they get very upset if, if they get too much questions. So they're a group that have to be dealt with you know, really gently in that. But in time, when you get to know them and they're out in the field with you and that stories come from each other. And indeed, um, one of the, the, the best results we've got is from providing food. Uh, we would have a chow down after a morning session, clearing rhododendron maybe out on Abbey Leaks Bog or the Irish Peatland Conservancy Council. We put on some food for them, get around the pot, get talking, and uh, it's a really great way of breaking down barriers and getting some real, uh, real progress working with the group. And they're, they're as I say, very giving. They, they volunteer their time. Uh, we aren't looking for free labour from them. They understand that. And hopefully the work that they do with us then could go towards um, them when they're seeking work, you know, that they can show that they've been involved in conservation projects, and um, they've also got some experience of hand tools and that if the work is building or, or garden maintenance, things of like that. So that's very useful. The other project I'm involved with is uh, coming to your natural census. Uh, both these projects are up on the Heritage Council website. And uh, coming to your natural census is a pilot project or leads on from a, a pilot project that we did with uh, Creative Ireland. Um, the idea was to go to the National Council for the Blind of Ireland and see if they'd be interested in uh, some biodiversity classes. The idea being that uh, if, if uh, people who are blind are out in their environment could understand some of the bird species that they're hearing, that they get a heightened experience of their natural surroundings. Um, a few mistakes I made at the beginning was in thinking that uh, people who are blind have uh, some sort of super senses in relation to hearing and that. Uh, I fell right into that one and it was very quickly explained that a lot of people lose their sight at an elderly age and lose their hearing at the same time. So uh, unfortunately uh, that idea went out the window. So you know uh, it was a case of baby steps and learning from them. They taught me uh, what they needed. Uh, I also learned very quickly that technology is their friend. Um, we were talking about birdsong and we brought in some recordings and they very uh, quickly told me that they, they have access to a huge library of birdsong using Alexa. So uh, while I was trying to download recordings of birds uh, from the Irish landscape, they were able to just call it up an Alexa. So uh, put me in my place. Um, so the, uh, the outcome of, of all these classes was the uh, outing we, we had out in North Bull Island. We promised them if they could stick out the classes with me and some other people, some experts, that uh, we would take them out on an outing, which we did to North Bull Island. There was uh, 7,000 geese probably out in the mud flats there feeding that morning. And um, Ricky Whelan from Birdwatch Ireland, who partnered with us, was brilliant. He brought them out. He uh, very quickly understood their needs again, listened to them. So he was describing birds, not by necessarily the call, but uh, the direction. So, you know, over your left shoulder, you'll hear a whimbrel over your right shoulder. And uh, there, there's a lapwing calling, things like that. So uh, there, there are lots of little tricks that uh, you can learn as you go along. And again, very rewarding, very challenging at times, but very, very rewarding. And I'd encourage anyone, if they can bring out a, a group of uh, people with sight impairment, it, it's very worthwhile. 
um, I learned also that uh, whatever walk you do, to keep it short, um, they find it very difficult to use the stick for more than an hour. An hour is, is perfect for them. Um, apart yeah. from the bird song, then we, we led on to a uh, bat recording. So we had Bat Conservation Ireland with us and they gave them a talk on the calls of the different bats in Ireland. We were fascinated with that. Obviously, they had some sort of uh, affiliation with bats who are using echolocation and uh, moving without sight. And uh, we even brought in some specimens, which was a great excitement for them to, to put a bat in their hand. Now, uh, it was a challenge for some, but uh, they really enjoyed it. So there are just a, a couple of the projects I'm involved with with the Heritage Council, but uh, I'd be happy to take any questions, or as I say, I'm on the, the website there if anyone needs to come back and ask me anything afterwards. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lorcan. And I think the message, the overall message from all those lovely experiences that, that Lorcan has shared is to not be afraid to give it a go. If you, if you get it a bit wrong, you can, you can fix it. People will help you. People are just so delighted uh, to be brought in and to be included that every effort that's made will have a reward. So if you're a bit anxious or a bit nervous about sort of reaching out to a community you're not familiar with, just think about Lorcan perhaps making the walk the first time three hours long and thinking as he was losing people and so on. Like we only learn by trying. And it's a great message for, for today, for this week, for all of you uh, listening in, that to just step slightly outside your comfort zone and see how to bring new communities into Heritage Week. Because as Lorcan says, people have so much to offer and so much to give and take so much joy out of not just being included, uh, but, but being allowed to make a contribution and being encouraged to do so. So our next uh, uh, panellist is Lisanne McLaughlin. I have a complaint to make immediately, Lisanne, because you have to be six to 12 to take part in her wonderful projects. And apparently I'm just a bit, bit beyond that now. I mean, between projects involving explaining to children about Roman engineering or understanding about round towers or the ancient recipes written with a quill, uh, Lisanne specializes in bringing alive history and archaeology and the built landscape and the natural landscape effectively our heritage and she does that I think with a mixture of skill and imagination and ingenuity but I would imagine above all with great patience because small children as we know are hugely enthusiastic but they they, they do require a lot of input and she and her team at Digit are prepared to do that. So, Lisanne, thanks for coming today. And again, if you can give us a flavour of the kind of experience, the passion uh, that you can bring to, 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 to bring to life your projects for those that are listening. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And uh, hello, everybody. And I know that one of the great places that I have learned is by visiting archaeology, centers and heritage places all over Ireland. And I've learned from you and I hope I have something to offer you that will be useful to you today. So I have been lucky enough to been a part of Dig It Kids. I kept co-founded it um, a, oh, just over 10 years ago. And I love children and I love the way that, that they learn. And they're very different learners than adults. Now, uh, although Susan said uh, she's too old, I often have grannies listening in and parents listening in on our virtual, we've done a lot of workshops virtually, and uh, they love to listen in and watch the engagement. And I love that too. So Susan, uh, sign up for the next one. So Dig It Kids is a private company, we're not, and we have been very luckily funded by a number of um, OPW sites that have asked us when they've had a festival or event. And of course, we've contributed to Heritage Week in many locations over the years. And we know that kids don't listen like adults. It's really easy to keep an adult because they'll be polite enough to listen to you. But children are kinesthetic learners. They need to be embodied in their learning in order to do it. So when you take the piece of heritage that you're excited about, whether it's a, a built monument, like this is the Hellfire Club behind me, uh, or whether it's uh, the natural environment, you have to give a piece of your heart to your children. 
um, because the interpreter has to be able to relate to them right in at their level. And children pick up on the content that you bring to them. So you create a safe space for them and a playful space. We are all so much better when we're playful. So we throw in dreadful jokes and banter. And if our if we only get a ha, 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 really full laugh, we're okay with that. You know, if they're a hard act to impress, we're okay with that because that's still an exchange. So when children are playing with their hands into something, we know we have them engaged and we'll keep them on board with that. It also gives us an opportunity to support them. They'll do something that they'll be proud of. We'll fire their curiosity into something and then you have them. The picture behind me is, you might recognize it, the Hellfire Club in the top of the Dublin mountains. But the little boy is uh, one of ours who's attended a few of our, um, of our uh, virtual uh, uh, workshops, for want of a better word. Fortunately funded by the local area in Tara and in, Ta in Tala. And uh, he attended this and then recently, about a year ago, we did a workshop on, of course, there's a passage tomb under the ground that he's standing on, the remains of a passage tomb. Uh, you can imagine that some of the stones went into this behind me to build up that. <laughs> but this little boy uh, did something that we really love. We got him to make a passage tomb with his own hands. We told him a story. I'm a story writer. So I brought him back in his imagination to the first builders and I, and engaging them empathetically so that they actually cared about the first builders. And whatever topic we take, I create a story around it that will help them to connect the then to the now. And I pull on their heartstrings on purpose so that they care about the then to the now. So about a year later, this little boy asked his dad, can we go see the Hellfire Club? And he stood there and although his dad assures me he forgets lots of other things, out poured a whole story about the builders and how they brought it here. And he got to change places with the teacher. He was the teacher. And it created this really sweet moment that his dad just had to tell me about. He was the teacher. And his dad had that lovely opportunity of saying, wow. You heard so much, you know so much. And how do you feel about that? His dad said and to the little boy. And he said, it is cool. Now I'm willing to settle for cool. That's a colloquial way of doing it. So guys, if you can find a piece of heritage around you that you're excited about, find an interpreter who will give it heart and give it things that they can actually do and make and get their hands into. At Dig It Kids, we um, have some free resources that might fire your own imaginations on our website, navigate your way to the resources page. And there are some that are free and then there's some that you have to hire us for, but there you go, that's it. And I hope that you will also get to a place where your children will love their locality because to me that's the benefit of it. When they interact in it, they can appreciate some of the, uh, the benefits of, oh I'm so sorry, I don't know why that happened, some of the benefits of their heritage locally. Um, and there you go. That's me in a nutshell. You told us to, to keep it short. So I'm again happy to take any questions later. Great, and thank you, Lisanne. And don't worry, there is there will be a chance to ask some questions. And again, I suppose, like Lorcan, that same passion and that same idea of how do you how do you connect with that that age group? How do you fire their imagination? And I think you put it very well, Lisanne, when you said you find a way to give your heart to the children. You find something that fires you, and then you are able to find a way to fire them. And they are great listeners when they are engaged. And there's nothing to beat the enthusiasm uh, of th that age group. When, when they get going, they don't stop. 
so that is more passion, I hope, and more uh, inspiration uh, for all of you uh, listening in. Um, and we're now going to hear from uh, Tomas Devery. And Tomas, perhaps uh, uh, in another uh, life, uh, met Lisanne because he is a media and arts graduate from Maynooth University. And he's from a village uh, in, in County Offaly called Pulla, which was famous for making bricks as well as famous for peat. And so Tomas has, had a, has, has a passion, continues to have a passion for his local place, but particularly for the stories about the bricks and the peat. And I suspect that he and Lisan could probably have great fun because he knows how to make a traditional brick. He's already done it with his dad. And, um, and he, again, is, is very specifically engaged with, a, with an area that he was born in, so he's rooted in it. And that is another type of passion that you can bring is when you're from a place and you feel it uh, every day you step outside the door. So um, be thinking about your questions and um, listen to, what, to, to the sort of passion that Tomas is bringing uh, to, this, to this webinar. Thanks, Tomas. Thanks very much, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, so just like what Susan said there, I think the key takeaway uh, with heritage is passion. And I know um, I have a background in, in media and, and, and production of, of video and radio. It can seem intimidating when you start off um, thinking about maybe recording something and how is this going to work or how is that going to work? The most important thing is, 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 like Susan said, is your passion. Um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to go try, do it, fail if you get nothing out of it doesn't matter you might get it might splinter off into something six months down the line someone might say oh we did a bit on that or someone already had interviewed this person and two groups might come together and shared passion there again is is your friend and um, so just a bit about some of the projects i've been involved in and how it's it's, it's a wider sense of again passion and um, the one of the one of the videos that we did was uh, about a local history story surrounding my, my, something my dad would have known from a long time ago. Um, so something that comes up to me a lot is that sometimes heritage or history can be something of a, of a perishable resource. Um, so not to put too much of a, a time pressure on, on people, but if there's something you're thinking about doing, don't be afraid to, to give it a go. Um, because sometimes people with stories uh, might be uh, later on in their life, they're not, none, none of us are going to live forever. But sometimes you often hear at funerals that people say, I wish we'd asked them more about this or I've done a bit more about that thing. They, knew. they were the, maybe the only person left in the village who'd lived a certain way. And if you don't capture that history, it could be lost, that heritage, it could be lost for future generations. Um, and you would be amazingly shocked about the level of interest that a wider village or group or town has and the support that they'll give if you have a launch or if you release something. Um, so the amount of uh, people that showed up, I was involved now, I can't take a whole lot of credit for it. Many of my, my sister and my mother and people in the Pullet Heritage Group, uh, we published a book about brick making, uh, as Susan mentioned. Um, so it was a, a style of, of br making bricks uh, sort of specific to the area and it took a long time. It took about two years, I think, from when we started to when we actually had our launch day. Um, and I, we launched it in the community centre in the village itself. And I was over there uh, with Noel, one of the guys involved, and we were putting out chairs and we were kind of saying, oh, that should be enough. We had to put out nearly double the amount of chairs in the end uh, with the amount of people that showed up. There was huge interest out there in, in heritage in, and in history. Um, but you kind of have to take the first steps as a group individually. Uh, it's always it's always easier as a group because you have people helping you out and spurring you on, and helping you out and you actually go out to, to capture the history. But that was an amazing launch. We had all the books sold out that we printed basically, and uh, there was a huge attendance. And even two or three years later, people still come up and say, "I sent that book to people in Australia. I sent that book to people in New York." Second, third generation people who loved that they could get their hands on something uh, historical and, and got to do with the heritage of a place they came for. So I might have a, a background in media and uh, some people say, oh, that's why you're doing videos about this stuff. 
don't be afraid with phones now you can you can go out and, and capture a pretty good video interview with someone who maybe saw something in the village and it's no longer the way things are done it's the first person to see electrification come to a village is something my father often talks about and um, so i can only really say what susan has said already is don't be afraid to give it a go it's it's well worth it and people will show amazing interest when you do uh, create something that they can get their hands on and engage with the local history and the local heritage. Thank you so much, uh, Tomas, and that's a lovely sort of uh, that that small space where people are are still in Ireland, still know their neighbours in many places, still want to know more about their roots. If we don't know where we come from, it's very hard to know where we're going. And the value of heritage is in everything that we do. Indeed, I'm, I'm reminded that the, the house next door to my house, which is a, an old farmhouse, uh, they, they made pillows once upon a time. They plucked the, the birds and they gathered up the feathers and they made pillows. And they, this is just a small cottage and that was how they lived their life and that's how they made their money. And I'll confess, I haven't done anything about that. I haven't dug around and found out more about that story. I'm sure it was a relatively common thing around places in Ireland, but I actually don't know. So perhaps, Tomás, you've inspired me today uh, to think about that. So while you guys are coming up with some questions, um, I might just go back, Lorcan, uh, and ask you a little bit more there about engaging with um, people who are in um, indirect provision. And, and, and of course, then some will move from direct provision into the community and some will find uh, part-time or full-time work anxious to give back and anxious to be part of this. And, you know, do you find that, I think you, you said, just go, if you like, directly to a centre. I mean, does that, can you do that? Is that okay to do that you kind of knock up uh, on the door and say, hi, I'm, I'm Lorcan uh, and, I, I, and I have a project. Is, is that okay? Yeah, yes, it is. Um, now, you, you will be going to the reception desk and each of these centres are managed by a company and they'll have a front of house staff. So, you know, that's who you're initially talking to. And, uh, you know, they're very used to people coming in and asking questions and looking to make contact or whatever. Um, generally, what they have is a notice board at each of the centres and to have a flyer uh, pinned to the notice board people will come down and see that they have their own organizational meetings and that and um, people who don't have English or might be just speaking in Arabic or whatever uh, people will will uh, translate for you there so uh, you don't need to have it in a, a foreign language it helps if you have maybe French or something like that depending on where the people are coming from but uh, yeah the, the, the company will help they're, they're anxious to to be knitted into the community, for sure. Um, what uh, I was informed of and made sense to me was that people who have been in the country for a number of years, you know, there, there was a time there that there were in direct provision for a number of years, you know, they tend to be now in the college scene, they're going to college, they, can, they want to learn English and that, and they want to get through college so that they can apply for work later. So, you know, you don't need to be getting in their way or take it personally if they say, I can't make it on Saturday, I'm in college or whatever. So um, yeah. that can yeah. happen. Yeah. yeah. Just to say, sorry to interrupt for a second, Lorcan, just to say, of course, if you have a question, uh, please use the chat facility and then the questions will come back and I'll be able to share the questions with the panel. If it's, a, if it's particularly for one of the panellists, then just if you can specify that, that would be helpful. Um, and Lorcan, of course, the other great part about, um, about engaging with people from other countries is that they share, you know, even with, with broken English or small English, people share their heritage. And that makes that global community a little more alive, particularly true with food and the whole, um, you know, the whole area. I know, I know it's not quite in your bag, uh, Lorcan, directly, professionally, I mean, but food is a great way of, of engaging with other groups because we all eat and we all have ceremonies and we all have rituals around food. And it can be a really great way to share, you know, the making of soda bread or butter or something very basic to our culture and then find out 
what that what the other groups would do similarly whether they they won't be making soda bread they'll make some other kind of bread and it's a great way to bring people together you talked about the chow down after the after the rhododendron I, I tell you that that would be very necessary after that but you're right bringing people together over food is always a is always a good way and so sharing recipes is another way of including people well actually um, uh, I've, I've made contact with the botanic gardens and uh, a lead on project we're hoping to do now is uh, some of the great collections that the botanic gardens hold would be in some of these countries that the uh, refugees are from, maybe Syria or somewhere like that. And the collections would have locations uh, written with the collection. And they don't always make sense, you know, no more than somebody coming to Ireland but down Ballymore. There are several Ballymores. So uh, we're hoping to um, tee up people from different parts of the world with the collections they hold there and to go through them. They're digitizing them at the moment and to take out any errors and bring their knowledge that they have of their country uh, and maybe some of the uses that these plants or seeds right. were used for. So that'll be That's, a great way of giving back as well. Absolutely. Um, Lisa, a question, a very practical question for you, I guess, is um, you know that idea of when you're engaging with young children, the sort of procedures that you need um, is the guard the vetting in place and so on how what kind of advice might you be able to offer broadly I mean I know a lot of our audience will know some of that already but just to remind them uh, yes. about what, what what would be helpful here uh, thank you for that very relevant question of course uh, when there's children involved uh, guard of vetting is essential for the people who are going to be interpreting that um, if the children are with their parents, um, f continuously, that may not be the case, okay? But you do, you are required, of course, to have, like you have for parents and vi for visitors, you need to have a, a full safety assessment, um, you, which takes children's uh, coordination into account. Um, so, no, it, it, you know, sitting on your hunkers at the edge of a cutting isn't necessarily a great idea if they're going to go head first into an archaeological <laughs> dig site or something like that. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, so children's coordination coming in into to play on that. I'm wondering if that answered your question. Um, guard of vetting is obviously available. Um, it, if you're working for the OPW, it'll come through the OPW or the various organizations. That it's, it's not like a, a once off thing. Yeah, Lorcan, is there something there that might be said on behalf of the Heritage Council in relation to colleagues and, and, and friends here in the audience that would be helpful? Well, uh, we have a child-friendly uh, policy, which is up on our website there, that might give you some direction there. Uh, certainly when you're taking photographs of that, obviously you need permission if you're publishing yes. them. Uh, but, you know, a lot of that is contained in the, the vetting, you know, it's common sense stuff. Uh, you know, it doesn't preclude you from getting involved with kids and that's very important and the uh, interage thing is very important too so you know uh, it's they're not there to uh, restrict you you know from from having a very inclusive project um but yeah common sense don't leave anybody on their own things like that uh, photographs are all things that are, are very important but you'll, you'll find them on our website certainly under our child policy there if that's helped and and if in doubt ask you know there's so many people now who are aware of the policies and they can be confusing don't be afraid to find somebody probably through the heritage council is the quickest route and um, there's another question um about are there any protocols this might be a question for Thelma or Lorcan you may know the answer it might require actually an email to the heritage council I'm not sure are there specific protocols surrounding um uh, using a heritage week event to raise funds for a museum is the very specific question. So I know that in the past, you know, it was very much about events to share with the community, but uh, is there, a, is it ruled out or ruled in, or is that a question for someone that may not be at the seminar today? So I can answer that one, Susan. Excellent. Um, so with Heritage Week, the, the, the preference is to, to have free events if you're doing events, because particularly this year, because it's inclusion. Um, there would be occasionally there would be Heritage Week events that there would be a fee related to, but that tends to relate to maybe if you were bringing in a third party to, to host the event and there was a charge related to that. Um, so, but also 
if you were looking at Heritage Week and your fundraiser, there might be a, a free aspect that you could you could uh, propose or submit for Heritage Week that would support your fundraiser. Um, and we could talk about that if you want to, whoever um, asked that question, if they want to email heritageweek at heritagecouncil.ie and we could see just how that might be fleshed out a little bit more. So that's encouraging because it's not a absolutely not, it's about how to manage that. And, and again, you know, questions that might require, that are protocol questions, so to speak, um, you know, always the Heritage Council are there to help you uh, to sort those out because the idea is to be trying to include and help and engage with people rather than to exclude them. Um, any suggestions from any of the of the panelists um, about how you might bring people to into a community who've just relocated there? N not necessarily non-nationals, but but you know ordinary folk who may have moved uh, in the recent months and are looking for a way to engage and don't quite know how to sort of find something that's going on. Is there are there any clever thoughts about how that might be done? Uh, Susan, just just something that occurred to me now that might be helpful would be uh, accessing the Heritage Council, heritagemaps.ie. Um, there's also the uh, 5K um, project that, that that's up on our website too. So um, maybe a local community could access their heritagemaps.ie and pick out some of the uh, you know more interesting aspects to their area and do a feature on them. That would be very doable, I would have thought. Do lo are local libraries part of the network for supporting Heritage Week? In other words, if I went, if I was new in town, I might go to my local library because they're a great source of information about all kinds of things. Are you in the local libraries? Tell me that might be one for you or? Um, yeah, so I'm just thinking back on last year specifically, we would have had a lot of libraries that would, um, would have organised Heritage Week projects. Um, and, and would have used Heritage Week to, to publicise those or encourage people to engage, particularly maybe seminars or online, online events. Um, and also the, the heritage officers in each county would maybe be a good place to, to look if you were looking at maybe um, reaching out to new audiences in your county. Okay. Um, now, there's another good question here. Um, a group had a, a project that they carried out with local schools at, at Christmas, the Christmas just gone. Is that a project that they, given that the, sub, the substance of the project is appropriate for Heritage Week, is that something that could be included now? Can it, if, it, if it's in video form or whatever, can, be, can it be uploaded? Yeah, Even so, if it wasn't done specifically for Heritage Week, if it's worth sharing again to a new audience. Yes, yeah, so we love to see people do that. This isn't just about creating something new for Heritage Week, but it's about taking something that you maybe did before, but you want to expand the reach. And again, that fits in really nicely to, to this year's theme. So for that particular um, example, absolutely um, share that with us. And, and maybe have a think about how you're going to expand your audience. Again, there might be other groups out there that have done research in previous years and they want to just build on that research. So they have the foundations there, but they're adding a new element for Heritage Week. And again, those are things that we really like to see. Great. Um, Tomas, given that, that one of your strengths is indeed the fact that you're a media graduate and that you are you know, capable and able of using uh, video to, to, to the benefit of, of, of your audience. Can you just maybe highlight exactly how much more um, how much more people connect visually now than before? I mean, any of us on social media are aware of that. Maybe just reflect on that for a moment. The idea perhaps of seeing a, a, a little short video of you and your dad making bricks as opposed to you writing it down. Yeah. And I know it's not for everyone, but, but there are lots of people out there who are keen to, to be more visually capable. Yeah. So maybe you might yeah. reflect on that for a moment. That's, that's, that's definitely uh, true, Susan. Uh, there is definitely a, an intimidation factor around, I don't know what I'm doing here with cameras and editing equipment and audio. It's, it's more complicated than it looks. And you only, like you said, you only get better by, by kind of digging in and, and having a go at it. Um, there's loads of free YouTube videos for total novices to people that want to get good at you know, advanced editing skills or what equipment they might be thinking about buying through 
through some sort of fundraising they had we we had um we were granted some money by somebody who was passionate about about local history and uh, we looked up what equipment to to buy and we, we settled on a camera and that's what we used to film a lot of our stuff and it's kind of a part of the 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 local heritage groups stockpile of equipment and if new members come in they can take advantage of that and and it can be shared around members of the group and we're doing different projects and um, in terms of how things have changed from how people respond to uh, visual video and audio heritage that's captured through through that means compared to text it's it's so easy to share now. That's why it's just, we had a, Waterways Ireland came out and they were doing a project around heritage on the canal. And because Pola is a bit of a village that's on the canal, they centered around the bricks. Uh, so me and my dad were part of a, a little quick five minute video that we shot in one day in about two, three hours uh, where we dug up clay. My dad had had some of the old equipment um, and we made five or six bricks and wheeled them up uh, to the canal where the, they would have been brought to Dublin in, the, in back when the, the actual brick trade was going. That video, I think, has something like 15,000 views on Facebook. Um, I never thought about it until about a year later. And someone just said, that's after getting really popular. Because the amount of interest in history and, and heritage is, is huge. And people will tag people. People will send it to one another. Um, and that we we thought maybe a couple of hundred people might watch it, but it went out, went up to fifteen thousand. We were shocked, but there is just huge interest. Well, you see what's happened now. Somebody's asked in the group whether or not you give um, practical workshops on making bricks. <laughs> so there you go. Now there's a whole new thing for you. But again, it shows that people are. Uh, um, uh, Lisanne was making the point about children, you know, being kinesthetic. They want to do rather than listen or or see. But certainly, actually. Adults too are engaged by getting their fingers wet or, or, or dealing with something, creating something. Even if my brick, I know already, would not look anything like a brick, it would have a close approximation in colour only. Um, but anyway, uh, if you do uh, uh, give practical workshops uh, to most, we'll, we'll put you in touch with them. <laughs> we'll put you in touch with them. And in the meantime, I, I see uh, in the chat there that, that there will not be a, a printed booklet this year. Again, I would say in the past that the Heritage Week booklet was always a great thing and people would always be walking around with it in their hand. But look, it's online. The list of projects will be uh, online and there is um, the final date for submission for projects is beyond the end of Heritage Week. That's to allow, of course, for the fact that, you know, sometimes people are still working on a project during Heritage Week and might not get to, to, to upload it or to, to share it uh, on the platform until that time. Uh, and of course, there's the, promise of, um, there's the promise of an award at the end um, for anybody who's got their projects in by the 30th uh, of October. Um, so that's, that's, all to, um, that's all to look forward to. Uh, so don't forget, you can make, of course, your own piece of resource. If you're in a community area where you know there's two or three posters that if you put up, that you can encourage people or find more people to join. Of course, you can do that. But lots of groups, heritage groups or smaller community groups have their own WhatsApp groups or have their own, share their own way of getting in touch with each other. So don't be afraid to use those avenues as well. Um, so we are close to dr drawing uh, this webinar uh, to a conclusion. Um, remember, Heritage Council website will give you details again for those dates. Thelma has promised to share those slides at the beginning just to remind you of the sorts of highlights for this year, including people, finding ways, as Lorcan and Lisanne and Tomas have done, to include people who might not normally think about something. Uh, to feel that passion and find ways to connect with people. Um, and above all, to enjoy it, because that's what Heritage Week was always trying to do. It's not serious. It's not sitting down and having to learn it. It's about getting out there and enjoying it. Uh, whatever way you do it, whoever you engage with, you're bringing a smile to people's faces and they will bring one uh, to yours. Um, so. Thanks again for coming today. It's been great to see such an amount of people joining in. We look forward to the next webinars next week. Specific thanks 
to Catherine, who's done a great job uh, uh, with her interpretation, really terrific. Uh, to Tomas and Lorcan and Lisanne, your passion is very clear and we really appreciate you sharing it with us uh, today. And to Thelma and Martina and uh, Leela, the team that are helping to bring Heritage Week uh, to all of us, thanks to you too. And we'll see you soon.